Hi, welcome along to another video. This time we are going to look at an American news article from 1958, the 29th of November. How climate control can change the world. The paper is called the Saturday Evening Post and a search link is provided in the information section of this video, along with links to the other information mentioned. Thank you for your coffee donations which includes this magazine, it's very kind of you. We'll start in the contents where we find Stand By for Climate Control by Captain Howard T. Orville of the United States Navy, retired, as told to Joe Alex Morris. Captain Orville was the Chief Aerologist for the United States Navy on all technical and operational weather matters during World War XI. Sorry, I forgot we only count wars from the 20th century onwards nowadays. I meant World War II. To begin the article, it stated, Daring new meteorological science may bring us sunshine at night and rain on request. But if the Russians master the weather first, they might try to wash out our east coast and generally ruin our continent. So please keep in mind this was written during the start of the Cold War when there was a new enemy needed to reinforce the idea that a lot of money should be spent on the military industrial complex as a means of killing people for citizen control. Social uprising is always followed by people being blown up somewhere. In the accompanying image, we can see lots of artificial suns to provide day glow at night time with the intention to disturb all living nature's biorhythms. There is also a clear distinction between the planes carrying out weather modification by deploying silver iodide and the planes spraying chemicals for reasons not stated. This article is quite long and focuses often on Russia as an enemy. But there are also some other pieces of interesting information which we'll read now. Mankind has been worrying about the weather ever since the first farmer discovered how to plant the first hill of corn. And starting with Aristotle, a great many seers, astronomers, witch doctors and scientists have been trying to do something about it. Now, after two and a half thousand years of fumbling, there is reason to believe that the scientists can succeed, if given the opportunity, in a way that may affect the future of civilization even more drastically than the development of atomic power. As former chairman of the President's Advisory Committee on Weather Control, I should begin by making it clear that we are still at an early stage of meteorological research in weather control. Not all scientists agree on what men may be able to do in the future to modify the climate in which we live. We do not yet know enough about our universe for positive predictions. But we are learning rapidly and I can safely mention a few theoretical possibilities on the road to eventual control of the weather. The second of which is, in experiments in New Mexico, rockets have been used to spread chemicals that change the composition of the upper atmosphere. Successful development of the ability to alter the atmosphere could lead to far-reaching climate modifications and theoretically could free the plains states of droughts. The third mentioned, a fleet of perhaps a dozen satellites or artificial suns generating ultraviolet light some 22,000 miles out in space could amplify the night's air glow that exists around the Earth and thus turn darkness into semi-daylight. Such changes in our climate may seem as fantastic as a page from a science fiction book that they are glimpses into the future is obvious, but the future may be much nearer than we realise. 
I do not want to give anybody an erroneous impression that modern science will soon be able to guarantee a sunny day for your annual church picnic. Nobody, not even the old farmer's almanac, can do that. But I am confident that the next few decades will bring tremendous progress in man's ability to modify our climate. James B. Edson, Assistant Director of Research and Development for the Army, confidently predicts that man will travel to the moon in the next 10 to 15 years. Once space is conquered, we shall have taken a tremendous stride toward control of the weather. Exploration in the science of meteorology involves dangers as well as benefits. We cannot determine in advance all the results of artificial modification of the climate. But we do know that man-made weather, like Sputniks, might be used as a weapon of war. So, so far you should have the current weather modification being carried out in the western states of the United States of America, Oliver's travels in London, and the Vietnam War. We can look further at that later if you missed it. To continue the 1958 article from 63 years ago, Snow and ice absorb only 10 to 20 percent of the heat from the sun and reflect the remainder back into space. But government sponsored agricultural experiments in Alaska have shown that a minute sprinkling of coal dust, lamp black, or other colored pigments in a thin layer over the snow and ice results in absorption of perhaps 80% of the sun's rays. High absorption, of course, melts the ice and snow and warms the soil. This method has made it possible to extend the growing season in Alaska by several weeks in the spring and fall, autumn. If carried out on a large scale, it might melt the polar ice cap. The Russians, incidentally, have used such methods to grow vegetables, flowers and grasses on experimental farms north of the Arctic Circle. I have said a good deal here about the Russians because, while we have little information about what they are doing in weather modification, we know that under certain circumstances a dictatorship can produce surprising results, as with the Sputniks. Such surprises are less likely in a democracy. Some of our government-sponsored weather modification projects are kept secret because they involve national defence, but others, such as seeding of clouds to produce rain, are usually in the hands of commercial companies. This resulted in greater interest by our government and several projects were established. By the early 1950s, from $3 million to $5 million dollars was paid annually by farmers and water power companies to commercial cloud seeding concerns in an effort to increase rainfall, mostly in the western states. There is no question in my mind that the seeding of clouds, which was ridiculed by many scientists only a few years ago, has been proved effective within limitations in increasing rainfall. The Advisory Committee on Weather Control analyzed data of 12 commercial cloud seeding projects involving 427 storms which had been seeded. With the cooperation of government and educational groups, we set up experiments in various states from California to New Hampshire, with carefully designed controls to provide evaluation data. In its report, the committee concluded that silver iodide seeding of wintertime storm clouds in mountainous areas of the western states produced an average increase in precipitation of 10 to 15 percent, with heavy odds that this increase was not the result of natural variations in the amount of rainfall. Two more pieces then. With the cooperation of the Air Force, Rockets carrying small amounts of vaporized sodium and nitric oxide were fired some 60 miles into the upper atmosphere 
over White Sands, New Mexico. When the vaporized sodium was released, there was a glow of brilliant color across 20 miles of night sky, as if a bit of the heavens had been set aflame. The effect continued on a diminishing scale for 26 minutes. In addition, the release of nitric oxide created an artificial ionized layer of atmosphere which temporarily bounced back radio signals more efficiently than naturally ionized layers. And lastly, these experiments were primarily to study chemical changes in the upper atmosphere. But from the standpoint of weather control, they demonstrated significantly that such changes could be achieved artificially. If the composition of the atmosphere can be altered on a considerable scale, then eventually we shall find chemical combinations that will increase or diminish the effect of the sun's rays and in turn raise or lower temperatures on Earth. We already have reason to believe that while carbon dioxide in the air raises our average temperature, other chemicals may low, lower it. Whenever a hydrogen bomb is exploded, radioactive atomic dust is blown into the upper atmosphere where it forms a kind of canopy which reduces short wave radiation from the sun and cools our atmosphere. Okay, weather modification is today being carried out in the western states as a means to mitigate drought. After 63 years of it, where the drought is getting worse, would it not be time to give it up? I do not want to give anybody an erroneous impression that modern science will soon be able to guarantee a sunny day for your annual church picnic. Well, now it can. For $150,000, you can have a sunny day for your wedding at the church. Oliver's Travels have been offering that service for six years now. If we look at the original blog page from their website, we can see it has been deleted. Looking at the sitemap, we can find the cloud bursting service though, which was featured in many mainstream media articles. Taking a quick look at the deleted blog page via the Internet Archive, we can see in 2011, the weather was modified for the wedding of Kate Middleton and William Windsor. All the links are provided and the archive page contains links to all the MSM articles about Oliver's Travels services. Lastly, we know that about 10 years after this article was published, that the weather modification experiment, Project Gromit, was carried out in India and Pakistan in preparation for Operation Popeye to be deployed in the Vietnam War. I hope you learnt as much as I did from that article. Please support my work if you can. Happy New Year. Look after yourselves. See you next time.